Welcome to this week's episode of Double Line Minutes. I'm Jeff Mayberry with Sam Lau. Hey, hey. It's 10 a.m., just slightly after 10 a.m. here Pacific Time on October 18th. Hard to believe that we're already a month into fall. Uh, we got, I guess we only got one more podcast before Halloween, Sam, so hopefully you got your uh, your costume picked out. Yeah, one more uh, before that. Um, probably just going to go as a Packers fan again. Yeah, as usual. I guess that's not really a costume, though, but uh, I do put in <laughs> my uh, cheese sombrero. Uh, it's hard to believe we only have two more podcasts before uh, the election as well. True. All right. With that, it was a pretty quiet week. Why don't we kick off into the where are we for the week? All right. Uh, looking across the board here, it looks like a pretty decent week for some of your uh, traditional asset classes, at least, uh, starting with the S&P 500 here. That's up 90 basis points on this early close for, or sorry, not early close, this early record uh, for the week to date basis. Leading the way, had to do a little bit of a double take here, but utilities <laughs> is up over 3%. Uh, kind of getting close to that 3.5% up for the week. Uh, next best performers here are uh, real estate and financials, each up over 2% on the week. Uh, materials looks like it could get into the 2% uh, cohort there on the week. Right now it's at one nine, uh, up 1.97%. Uh, In terms of the laggards, we've got uh, energy leading the way down, uh, down 2.9%. Uh, healthcare down 60 basis points and tech just pretty much uh even on the week right now. So we'll see how that pans out through the rest of the day. Uh, Year-to-date basis, uh, the S&P 500 is up just over 24%. Uh, the best performer here, again, similar to the week-to-date performance, is utilities. That's up uh, 32.5%, if you can believe that. Uh, next best performer there is financials. Uh, just behind, it's at uh, 28% positive right now. But a clean sweep in terms of positive prints across the sectors for the S&P 500 on this year-to-date year-to-date window. Moving over to fixed income, starting out with treasuries, uh, the two-year note, is it? Yeah, it looks like it's just flat on the week. Um, <laughs> right now, it's at a yield uh, at 3.96, similar to where it closed uh, last Friday. When we move over uh, out the curve, the 10-year uh, note is at, uh, it's, it's uh, rallied in by three basis points on the yield. Right now, it's at a yield of 4.07. Uh, the bond, the 30 year bond is five basis points lower and yield at a yield of 4.37 for the week. So, what all this means for the broader bond complex here, the, the, the US Bloomberg bond aggregate is up 13 yeah. basis points thus far on the week to date basis. Um, it's down 1.3% on the month and up 3% on the year to date. Right now, it looks like pretty much everything is in the green with the exception of agency mortgage-backed securities for the week-to-date basis. That's just hanging in at a, a flat over the flat performance over the previous week. But leading the way here is emerging market sovereign debt up 40 basis points, um, followed by uh, high-yield treasuries and IG corporate credit. Just kind of a mixed bag there is all hanging out about positive uh, 20 basis points for the week to date. And then you finally, you've got bank loans to round it all out up about 10 bits on uh, the week to date basis. But similar to what we were just, I was just talking about for the SP 500, each one of these cohorts underlying um, what we talk about here on the uh, Minutes podcast are positive for the year to date basis, leading the way there's emerging market sovereign debt and high yield corporate credit, each up over 7% for the year to date thus far. The laggard here is going to be the U.S. Treasury market with the index there down, uh, or sorry, up rather, uh, to 2.5% on the year to date. Moving over to commodities, uh, wow, what a tough week if you were long uh, WTI crude oil. That's down. Uh, almost 8% on a week-to-date basis if you're holding on to the front-month contract of the WTI uh, crude oil futures there. Um, Year-to-date, that's down just over 2.5%, but we're back below the $70 handle. Last week, we closed at $75.50. Right now, we're looking at $69.75 per per barrel of WTI front-month futures there. Gold, on the other hand, is living this charmed life up another 2% on a week-to-date basis. That's at $2,733 a troy ounce. Uh, looks close to pushing its way up to thirty-four to, or $2,734, so it's uh, right there on that cusp. Uh, on a year-to-date basis, it's up 26.5%, but what this meant for the broader commodity index is the Bloomberg commodity index is down 2.25%. 
uh, still holding on to a positive print of 4% on a year-to-date basis. But with that wrap-up of the market, Jeff, sorry, did I cut you off there? No, I was just going to say that uh, at least the, the the good news about why energy was down, oil was down, is that the geopolitical risk has uh, decreased a little bit and it had been popped up. It seemed like the oil had been popped up from some um, increased you know, escalation of tensions over the Middle East. So from the humanity side of things, outside of the financial markets, uh, at least there is that good news. Absolutely. Absolutely. As we know, with the, the geopolitical risk that's uh, been out there, uh, we'll continue to watch some of the volatility you know, that's um, signaled through the WTI crude futures market there. But uh, for, for this week, we can take a sigh of relief. Uh, but with that, Jeff, do you want to kick us off on the, the macro side of things? Yeah, it was a pretty quiet week. On Wednesday, we did get the import prices. When you look at it, they came in uh, slightly softer than consensus, consensus expectations. Uh, headline import prices were down 0.4% month over month. We're expected, expected to be down 0.3% um, and we're negative 0.2% uh, the prior month. Uh, if you could take out petroleum, it was actually up 0.2%. Uh, it was estimated to be up 0.1%. And uh, even if you, and you go to, to export prices, uh, those were weaker than expected at negative 0.7% versus the negative 0.4% consensus. So a little bit of a softening there. Um, not too much really to look at there. Uh, I guess Wednesday or Thursday was the big uh, data release we we're looking for, the retail sales numbers. The retail sales uh, month over month for September was up 0.4%, uh, was expected to be up 0.3, so a beat there. And then if you take out autos and gas, it was actually a bigger beat, uh, was up 0.7% and was expected to be 0.3. Uh, kind of importantly, the, the control group, the retail sales control group, which is the portion that flows into GDP. Sam, as you mentioned last week, uh, that was also up 0.7%. Uh, so a big B there versus 0.3%. To kind of look at it, um, kind of break it down, there, you know, obviously there's there's some some that are winning, some that are losing. Uh, but really, when you kind of look at it, it's uh, persistently strong. The um, Even before the revisions to, to, the, to the income side of things, we've seen strong wage growth and strong pickup in credit expansion. And all those continue to support these uh, strong retail, retail sales numbers. Um, and so I think that was the kind of the catalyst for the uh, kind of a little bit more of the market moves there we saw on Wednesday uh, with rates selling off as things are maybe a little bit stronger than people were expecting. Uh, we also got the initial jo- and continuing jobless claims on Thursday. Initial claims came in at 241,000. That was uh, 18,000 below the 259,000 expectations. Continuing claims came in, let's, let's call it right on expectations at 1.87 uh, million people. Uh, it's interesting. We obviously, we've seen a lot of noise from the, the, the two hurricanes that kind of hit the southeast of the country. So we're going to need to kind of see where these these numbers shake out over the next three or four weeks um, because there are vol- they are volatile. And you did see spikes in the in some of those states uh, from from the hurricanes. Then they come back down, and then there's another the other hurricane hit, Milton hit, was like two weeks ago. So that one's gonna have to that one's likely to, to pop back up again. So we kind of need to, to to see how this all shakes out and whether we can um, pull out a bigger trend from there. Um, and then finally, the um, Atlanta Fed they put out their GDP now estimate. They put it out uh, you know a few times uh, a month or a few times a quarter before that quarter comes out. They just updated it today, and it's now estimated that the uh, the real GDP growth for the third quarter is at 3.4%. Uh, so, so a pretty big number there. Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like that's recessionary. It certainly feels like, it, you know, even though that that number does tend to come down over time, uh, we are getting close to the uh, release of the first estimate of the third quarter GDP here. Well, I think that comes out uh, right before the end of the month. And so that 3.4 number, it, you, know, you know, with a little bit of wiggle room, uh, certainly feels like we could get a three handle for the official estimate for GDP for the third quarter. Yeah, it certainly doesn't seem to be reflecting any weakness in the uh, the economy, at least based on the underlying data points that's looking at. But you know, just really this this feeling of uh, the economy just humming along uh, uh, based on this. And with that, you know, kind of look to see what what's the Fed thinking. Uh, didn't really get anything notable from the Fed speak, but the market has moved to we're at a ninety five. 92 to 95 percent chance of a Fed 25 basis point Fed rate cut on the November 7th meeting. Remember that meeting is on a Thursday, 
um, because the election is on Tuesday. The Fed meetings are two days, so they didn't want to meet during the election day uh, because they have to do their civic duty and vote. Uh, so they have they pushed the meeting back a day to to Thursday so they can meet Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so November, November 7th, 92% uh, chance of a cut. And then on December 18th, there's an 80% chance or so of another 25 basis point cut. So the market's pricing in, you know, a 75% chance we get a couple cuts this year. So it's kind of slowed down a little bit in the strength of uh, the, this data, but it'll be interesting to see as the data progresses. It seems like it's very much uh, going to be driven by the uh, non-farm payroll numbers. And whether those come out strong or weak is really going to drive the Fed's uh, movement because everything else seems strong and steady and uh, not too surprising. Yeah. So, I mean, with that, uh, we had a, looks like we had a pretty, pretty quiet week in terms of economic activity. And that uh, was somewhat reflected in the markets as well. We'll see what uh, next week brings. But uh, in terms of the things to keep an eye on, it seems like a fairly quiet week from the macro front, at least. Uh, so we can give you, you know, our listeners that. But uh, starting out on Monday, October 21st, we have the leading economic index. And that's expected to, to be, to come in on a month over month okay. basis at negative uh, 0.3%. Uh, the previous month was negative 0.2. That's kind of been the the trend lately. I mean, we've just had these neg you know slightly negative prints on the month over month. When I took took a look at the year over year um, basis the other day, which has you know, historically been a pretty decent um, indicator of recession activity, uh, if you believe in the the revisions in the data that they, that they probably employ, but right now it's just been hovering around this kind of this negative five percent year over year mark for for a couple months now. So it's just been just moving sideways there. So we'll see. It's likely to progress again when we get the year over year number there uh, on Thursday. You know, in addition to the initial jobless and continuing claims data, we're going to come out receive the S and P global PMI data for both the manufacturing as well as the services. Uh, the market seems to have been reacting a little bit more, you know, being a little bit more sensitive to that data, whereas in the past, it seems like it had been more triggered around the the uh, ISM data. But now, you know, it seems like the, the S&P global information is uh, also moving as we have some of this uncertainty around, especially Fed policy and their reaction function there. But uh, no estimates on that, but that's something we'll we'll be updating on next week's podcast. And then finally, on Friday, we get the durable goods orders that comes in. Um, the prior month activity for the headline number in September or in August was uh, zero over the previous month. Uh, for the month of September, is expected to be um, down one percent. And then when you take a look at it from an ex transportation's perspective, that's expected to be um, a negative zero point one percent. So a lot of that drag coming from the transportation side. Uh, but with that, uh, it seems like a pretty light week for the things to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mark Kimbrough. Uh does the, the econ summaries for us. And he highlighted in yellow what, what he thinks is the important ones. And when he highlights the S&P global in yellow, that's a, that's a sign of a slow week, I would say. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, you know, we do get, uh, we do have, so it should be a quiet week. The we next week, everyone kind of, it seems like people are waiting for, you know, obviously the election is a big one, big unknown out there. And then the payroll data comes out in two weeks on the 1st of November. So, you know, it, it seems like people are just kind of, uh, Waiting and see. No point in taking too much risk or taking too much risk off the table at this point uh, with those, these kind of big market moving, potentially market moving events coming out. But yeah, I think, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how things uh, look in, in four weeks forward, right? In the That's next right. month from today, That's we'll right. see after all the stuff clears up. Can't can't come soon enough. Yeah, just in time for the holiday season. All right. <laughs> well, with that, that wraps it up for this week, Sam. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thanks everyone uh, for checking us out today on uh, D Line Minutes, be it the the Spaces Live or if you're hitting us on the replays via you know, any of the the platforms there. But don't forget, you can hit us up on DX at D Line Minutes, or you can shoot us a message via email at minutes at doubleline dot com. And I don't think we got any uh, any paper snail mail uh, messages, even though you asked for them last week, Sam. Yeah, maybe it takes maybe, a longer. Maybe they're still week. yeah, they're probably still <laughs> stuck somewhere. All right, you can find more information on our website double dot com. Uh, YouTube channel is youtube dot com slash double one capital. And as I promised last week, we did get Jeff Sherman's asset allocation webcast up there on the YouTube's. Uh, it's titled "As the Cycle Turns." Uh, again, thanks for tuning in, and hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks, everyone, and good luck out there.